So this discussion is going to look at the clinical management of pain. So we know obviously pain being an important thing to take care of and address very early on in the injury process. We already kind of talked about the science behind pain and, and some of those things we're going to be kind of revisiting and hitting up. So I, what I would suggest is if there's like a structure or something or when we start to actually talk about the levels of pain control, if you're unsure about a structure or something like that, it wouldn't be a bad idea to maybe go back and just get, do a quick review of just some of the functions of some of the different areas in the central nervous system that kind of modulates pain. But what we're primarily focused on with this discussion is actually how we actually treat the pain clinically and we'll be talking about with different modalities how they actually affect uh, the, the process of, of trying to limit or decrease pain for our patients. So pain in the physical exam, so obviously everything stems from your exam. You're gonna be basically coming up with your assessment of what's wrong with the individual and also come up with some of the goals. So obviously trying to find out, I mean, obviously most of our patients are gonna have some sort of pain, but in order to find out what's causing the pain, you have to look at, at multiple things. So again, we're gonna look at uh, the follow-up questions and following with the what we call the PQRST. So P stands for provocation. So basically what, what is, essentially how did the injury occur? What activities increase or decrease pain? Q is the quality or characteristics of the pain. So, you know, for example, like how does the person describe the pain? Do they describe it as sharp? Do they describe it as dull? Do they describe it as aching? You know, those types of things could, could even trigger you into letting you know what type of, of pain that the individual could be having or even what structures are involved because obviously different types of structures and how they've been injured could kind of impact, um, you know, how they're experiencing their pain. R is for referral or radiation. So referred pain, again, there's a difference between the two. Referred pain is when you have pain that occurs at a site that's distant from the damaged tissue, and that does not follow the course of a nerve, okay? So it's just pain in another area, whereas radiating pain is pain from a nerve, and that will specifically follow the course of a nerve. So when you have actual nerve pain, that's radiating pain, and you'll actually be able to see it that where the pain goes, it kind of goes through that course where the nerve actually innervates, whereas with referred pain, you don't have that. The severity, uh, the severity just looks at basically how serious the pain is or just or how much pain the person's actually in, and we'll talk about the different pain scales and how that gets rated. T is for timing. So timing lets you know when does the pain occur. So for instance, again, we always talk about night pain and how that's a red flag. So, you know, that could kind of cue you in as to whether or not, you know, you, you are dealing with a musculoskeletal problem or possibly a more serious issue by talking about the timing. You know, does it only hurt maybe when they, uh, you know, when they're actually doing activity or maybe in some instances it actually gets better when they do activity and it, and it hurts afterwards. So those are all things that could clue you into the pathology. Um, and again, consider other, you know, other etiological factors that, that lead up to pain. So again, be aware. So specifically in the case when somebody can't necessarily pinpoint like when the pain really first started. So obviously like with acute sprain, strains, fractures, it's obviously a little bit easier to a lot of times discern the cause, but when you have your more persistent pain issues like your tendinopathies, your medial tibial stress syndromes, patellofemoral pain, those sorts of things that kind of come on in a more insidious manner, it, it can be a little harder to, to truly discern kind of what's wrong. So it's, it's good to kind of just keep an open mind to, to some of the different factors that could impact that. Okay, so some important points about pain characteristics. So you have to look at some of the different things relating to pain. And again, a lot of this can kind of tell you many times what you're dealing with. So for instance, sharp, very well localized pain that you may be experienced with a fracture or maybe even another type of soft tissue injury like a muscle strain, muscle tear, or a ligament sprain or tear um, versus diffuse pain, which you'd experience something with like myofascial pain or some other more 
uh, persistent type issue that, that has a little bit more of an insidious onset. Uh, keep in mind you may also have radiating pain from a nerve. Again, be able to differentiate that, you know, radiating versus referred pain, okay? So again, there's a difference between the two. So sometimes people, again, mix up their terms. So radiating pains from a nerve, or you might hear the term radiculopathy. So that's some type of pain stemming from a pathology to a nerve or a nerve root. Whereas referred pain is, again, pain in a separate location. You see this many times actually with uh, when there's injury to like the, the abdominal viscera or abdominal organs. Um, you know, particularly the, the organs in the body don't have many sensory nerves, so when they actually get damaged, the, the nervous system interprets the pain as coming from somewhere else. So there's a table that I'm gonna show basically showing you some of the referral patterns for, for um, things other than just musculoskeletal problems that you'd have to be aware of, okay, when you're, you know, because if, if you're talking to the patient and, you know, maybe they're complaining of back pain, but there, you know, there was no injury and, and nothing seems to, to correlate with an actual structural issue from a musculoskeletal perspective, you have to be able to separate those. Um, and, you know, then particularly like when you're doing your testing, like your range of motion testing and your strength testing, if it's not making sense that those structures are damaged based on, you know, the range of motion doesn't affect it and things like that, you then have to kind of consider other causes. And then the timing of pain or activities that cause pain. So, you know, that could be something in particular, again, with your more insidious onset type things. Like, for instance, somebody who has, you know, IT band problems, or say if they have IT band syndrome, many times they'll complain with pain with climbing stairs or running hills. Uh, people with plantar fascia issues, they usually typically complain of pain when they first get up in the morning. So to, to kind of get the, the timing of a lot of these injuries and, and how the symptoms usually come about becomes very important when you're looking to kind of discern and, and figure out what structures are actually causing the issue. So here is that table and it's also in your textbook. So you see here some of the different referral patterns and some of this we actually talk about in the, the general medical conditions class, kind of showing you that you, know, you could have a pathology and or injury to an area where you may get referred pain. And again, all these organs, the reason why you have this, so you know, take for instance the spleen. If someone does end up having some type of, let's just say, acute trauma to the spleen, they'll complain of shoulder pain. The reason why that happens is, again, as I previously said, the, the abdominal organs don't have meant much sensory input. So basically, when there's trauma there, the, the pain gets interpreted from the nervous system as coming from a different area. So that's why, for instance, the spleen, you'll get that pain in the left shoulder okay, from the injury. And then with all the other things you see, again, myocardial infarction, you know, very commonly we talk about the neck, jaw, and left shoulder pain that happens when somebody uh, begins to have a cardiac event. Okay, so looking at some other things with pain assessment. So intensity is very important. So how, you know, what, what yeah, how bad is the pain that the person actually has? Something to note, pain is a symptom, it's not a sign, okay? So pain is a symptom, it's a subjective thing that the person's experiencing, but we still do have to quantify it somehow because we have to be able to track whether or not a person's getting better or not from the treatment you're given. So there's different types of things that could kind of track changes associated with pain. The, more, the most common thing that a lot of people use is just a simple pain scale. So a pain scale from zero to 10, you have the patient rate their pain. And that's kind of like, you know, for instance, in the initial exam, that could kind of be your starting point and you could kind of see then whether the patient's pain increases or decreases from there. There are some other things. There's the visual analog scale. Um, you could actually see that in your textbook where there's basically just a line that says no pain, unbearable pain, and they just mark a spot on the line. Uh, there's pain charts. Okay, the pain chart on page 101, figure 6-2, Basically the person and the way they denote it in there is you can actually use different colors depending upon the type of pain that the person has and where they're reporting it. They could actually kind of color it into the picture.
Okay, so all of these are forms of, of patient reported outcomes. So again, it's just to help us track change over time, helps determine treatment effectiveness, and helps to quantify the patient perspective. Because again, because this is a subjective thing, you have to try to quantify it somehow. And you know, it's a little challenging, but at the very least, if you're you know you're using well documented means of doing it, you should be able to kind of track their pain over time and then let you know whether or not your treatment's being effective. And then the sensory affective motivational component. So we talked a lot about this in the, the chapter on pain when we, we discussed it earlier in the year. So there, there's obviously multiple things that impact a person's pain experience. It's not just strictly, you know, this tissue gets damaged in this manner or to this severity and everyone's going to have the same pain experience. There's multiple things that impact that. Uh, particularly a person's anxiety level. So pain may cause anxiety and or even possibly make some, if someone has, you know, an anxiety uh, disorder, it may actually make it worse. So it could impact a lot of different things. Um, you know, we have up here some examples or social relationships, school could cause problems with that. Uh, could affect sleep patterns. So beyond even just maybe even the pain keeping them up if it's that bad, you know, if they develop anxiety over it or maybe some other type of, of psychological problem, it could impact their sleep as well. And their, their perception of pain, you know, we had mentioned how the different pain tracks, so when a person gets injured, how all the different structures work and, and how the person ends up interpreting pain, you have pain not only just influenced by the structures that are damaged and how those you know that that message gets sent in the nervous system but you have other experiences that the person just have in life that that actually influences their pain perception so their previous pain experiences what's been their past experience with pain um, their family and cultural background so you know I, I had talked about how you know when, when you know parents get really you know they they may overreact to like their child falling when they're younger and maybe they got a cut or whatever and they were bleeding and they made a big deal about it that could possibly impact how that individual then perceives injuries and things later on in life so many things could, could impact that the specific situation so what are some of the situations surrounding the injury you know maybe if someone has a really severe injury if we're talking sports during a sporting event and you know maybe it's you know the the game prior to the playoffs or something like that all of those little things could impact uh, how the person's experiencing pain along with some of the other psychological uh, things that could kind of come along and impact how severe the, the person's pain is.